Good evening, and thank you for coming to our Cary Science Conversation. I, as Lori said, I'm Josh Ginsberg. I'm president of Cary Institute. Uh, it's my eighth year. Uh, I can't quite believe that. Uh, I'm looking, I don't have the poll results yet, but looking in the chat, I am really impressed. We have people from all over the country. We have people who have had their homes threatened and or families' homes threatened. We have people who study forest fires, people who have lived in areas with forest fires, and it just is a remarkable group of people. There aren't many silver linings to the pandemic, but we at Cary Institute have been doing public lectures for many years. And at the beginning of the pandemic, we pivoted to these virtual lectures. And one of the great things is our auditorium can hold 125 people. We're almost up to 200 people tonight, which is not uncommon. And we get a much, much broader geography. For those of you who are coming from across the country and don't know who we are, we are an independent research institute. We are not affiliated with any university or other institution. We're based in Millbrook, New York, which is a very rural community, just about 25 miles from the Hudson River and about 100 miles north of New York City. Uh, we are an institution that is known for doing uh, science that uh, has real impact on policy and management. So our tagline is science for environmental solutions. Our interests are diverse, but we have a sort of weighted balance on issues related to ecosystem science generally and a large scale study of, of ecosystems with a particular reference to forest and freshwater ecosystems, urban ecosystems and disease ecology, uh, the program on pandemic spillover and the impacts of bio, biodiversity and biodiversity loss on pandemics have been particularly germane this year, but then again, so that was the study of forest fires, which uh, one of our scientists, Winslow Hansen, who's on the panel tonight, has been studying for several years. So uh, we really uh, love that you're here. About half of you have not been to one of our events before. All I ask is that you come back if you like this one and you tell your friends, as Lori mentioned, we're doing one on forest carbon, so not unrelated to this one uh, in a couple, in a month. So uh, we would really enjoy you having here. About almost 30% of you have been personally affected by wildfires. And that's quite remarkable. Um, and even more of you, 60% have recently walked through a burned forest or grassland. I remember walking through Yellowstone just after the 1980s fires, late 80s fires, and being astonished by what I saw there. And then going back 20 years later and seeing something totally different. Um, and really lovely, it's a well-educated audience, as is often the case, and 86% of you are aware that there are positive impacts, so you won't be totally surprised by some of our comments. Let me introduce you to our speakers tonight. Let me start with forest ecologist at Cary Institute, Winslow Hansen. Uh, Winslow is not our most recent hire. He only had a brief six months with that uh, accolade, but he joined us in January of 2021 uh, in the sort of middle, uh, late middle end of the pandemic. Since we don't quite know when it's going to end, it's hard to say what part it was. But Winslow came to us from the Earth Institute and Lamont Darty Labs at Columbia University. He did his PhD in integrative biology at the University of Wisconsin in Madison um, and uh, an MS in Alaska and uh, then was at the University of Montana. Winslow has a, a deep interest in modeling of forests and forest fires down to the individual stem and all the way up uh, to the global level. So uh, it's a pleasure to have Winslow here tonight and a pleasure to have him at the uh, Cary Institute as a research scientist. Um, that's a nice segue into Phil, Phil Higuera, who is a fire ecologist at the University of Montana, where Winslow was an undergraduate. Phil is a professor of fire ecology in the Department of Ecosystem and Conservation Sciences. Um, and he looks at paleoecology and fire ecology. He runs the paleoecology and fire ecology labs. I think Phil is, is particularly uh, uh, suited tonight to talk about uh, both the history and the future of forest fires. And we're really pleased to have you, Phil, uh, as a panelist. Last but not least, fires are not just an ecological phenomenon, they're a social phenomenon. And Kat Edgley is a wildlife social scientist working at Northern Arizona State University. She's an assistant professor there. Uh, and she really looks at the, the community adaptation to wildfire and how people adapt to fire prone habitats and how people move into and are integrating or inter, uh, intersecting more often uh, with fires. 
I think this understanding of environmental hazard is critically important, both from an ecological perspective and a social perspective, because without that, we will not be able to manage uh, both the people and the fires uh, to an extent that is necessary in an era of climate change. Um, as people know, and as our first slide shows, fires are not just in the news, fires are, are radically on the increase. Um, and so I'm gonna start, I referenced um, uh, Phil's interest in history and, and, and current and future predictions. So let me start by asking Phil, you know, how has fire activity in Western US uh, changed in the recent decades? You can go back further if you'd like, but how has it changed and why has it changed? You're muted, Phil. Got it. All right, Josh, thank you. Um, yeah, pleasure to be here. Great to see all the information in the chat. Welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, so why, how and why has fire activity changed in recent decades? And I'll keep it focused on recent decades. Since, since about the mid-1980s across the Western U.S., we've seen a significant increase in the amount of area burned by wildfires. The, the trend continues to increase you know, throughout the 21st century. You see some of the numbers up there right now. Um, in addition to you know, the increase in area burn, this comes with increased exposure to wildfire smoke. We know so millions of people being exposed to wildfire smoke. Um, and also an important trend that parallels this increase in area burn is that the way that fires are burning is also changing. So fires are burning more intensely, literally releasing more energy than they have in the past. And that means that they can kill more vegetation and they're harder for firefighters to manage. Um, now, the key question that, that many of you here and many of our society has is why is this happening? Um, I'm gonna highlight three things. The first, kind of an overarching driver of this increase in wildfire activity that we're living through is climate change. Um, now fire, you know, fire is not new in, the, in recent decades and Winslow will highlight this. It's, it's been part of our planet for 420 million years. So fire itself is not new, but as climate is changing, um, basically fuels are becoming drier and drier and easier to ignite. So warmer temperatures in the absence of a big increase in precipitation, we basically are, are living in, in an atmosphere that's thirstier and thirstier. So it pulls moisture from both live vegetation and dead vegetation. And those drier fuels are really easy to ignite. And when they ignite, fires spread more rapidly. And in essence, as fuel aridity increases, we end up with more and more years like 2020, like 2021, um, and we end up with more and more large wildfires. So that's kind of an overarching influence across the West. Uh, one important aspect of, of fire in general is that things vary depending on where you are. So in addition to, to climate change, um, amplifying or enabling more fire activity, uh, there are also, influences on vegetation and from past land management and, and other aspects. But before we go to that slide, um, sorry, let's go back one, right? And in a key piece of, um, a key piece of research that's come out in the last several years is the ability to, to disentangle the degree to which these changes in climate and increase in fire activity are from human activity or not. So kind of the best statistic we have right now is that about half of the increase in wildfire activity in Western US forests is due to human caused climate change. So again, we would expect to have fire in the absence of human caused climate change, but about half of that increase that we've experienced in the last several decades can be attributed to human caused climate change, specifically through this increase in fuel aridity. Okay, now next slide. On top of this, vegetation across the West has changed significantly over the past century due to a variety of reasons, um, ultimately reflecting land management that has uh, focused on fire suppression, policies that have limited indigenous fire use, and 
in particular in low elevation ecosystems and ecosystems that burned frequently in the past, you know, once every few years to few decades, this lack of fire has led to an increase in vegetation uh, relative to what these ecosystems have, ha how they've been characterized in, in the deeper past. And then finally, humans, we are really important contributors to fire activity in the West. We expand when and where fire can occur, mainly by adding ignitions onto the landscape. So we add ignitions outside of the traditional lightning driven fire season. And we add ignitions in places where lightning is otherwise not a factor, like coastal Pacific Northwest, for example. And increasingly, we are living more and more in flammable landscapes. And the statistic there on the slide highlights a really important lever that we have, and that is most of the fires that threaten humans are in fact caused by humans. So while we have a lot of the West that is experiencing wildfire from lightning ignitions, consistent with the way that fire has functioned in those systems in the past, a lot of the fires that reach the news and a lot of the fires that we hear about are in fact caused directly or indirectly by human activities. I think the answer to that, Phil, is wow. Uh, you know, it's the perfect storm. You've got climate change that is leading to drier environments, drought. We've got a legacy of management, people living in those areas that never lived there before, uh, suppression of fires. Um, it sort of is the perfect storm and it, it's quite remarkable. You know, I think the point that you made that fires have been with us for millions of years and are part of the ecosystems that in, in or many ecosystems are fire adapted. You know, um, I'd be curious, uh, Winslow, I'm gonna pitch you this one. You know, how are Western, uh, particularly American West, but Western um, fires and Western uh, forests, sorry, uh, that are adapted to and, and depend on fire because it's been part of the landscape for so long, obviously not at this intensity, not at this frequency, and not at this extent, but it's clearly been part of the landscape. What are the ecological adaptations and evolutionary adaptations uh, uh, for forests in the West? Yeah, thanks, Josh, for the question. And also wanted to say thank you to the, the audience for, for joining us tonight. It's really exciting to be able to talk with this, talk about this with you all. Um, so one of the fundamental properties of, of life on Earth is that for organisms to survive over long periods of time and to thrive, they have to become adapted to their local environmental conditions. And as, as Phil mentioned, fire has been one of those local environmental conditions that organisms have experienced for you know, roughly 400 million years. Even in the Western United States, the forests that we think of today have, have experienced fire for you know, at least 12,000 years. And they've developed a, a tremendous diversity of adaptations to fire that links directly with the unique fire regime that they experienced prior to Euro-American settlement. So for example, in low elevation dry forests, like in the Southwestern United States, prior to Euro-American settlement, fires burn very frequently, every couple of years. But they were always low severity fires, well, often low severity fires that burn just the surface fuels, as you can see in this picture. And some of the dominant tree species, like in this example, ponderosa pine, have adaptations like really thick bark that help protect the inside of their stem from those low severity burns. They also generally tend to have a higher canopy base height, which is the distance between the ground to the, the base of the needles so that the fires don't get up into the canopy and kill the tree. Now, in contrast, in places like the Northern Rocky Mountains, conditions were often too cool and wet to have fires for you know, something like 100 to even 300 years. And so fuels would build up. And, and when a fire did occur, it was often what we call stand replacing, which means the majority of the mature trees were killed by the fire. But these species have some traits that they're adapted that help them survive, well, not survive, but deal with those types of conditions. And, and we call these fire embracers. So one of the prime examples, and it's close to my heart because it was a key part of my dissertation, was lodgepole pine, a, a dominant species throughout much of the Rockies. 
And they actually produce serotonous cones, which just means that the cones stay closed for many years until they're heated by fire. And once they're heated, they open up and they drop their seeds onto this post-fire environment. You can see a picture of a serotonous cone down there in the, the corner of your screen. Those seeds are dropped into a post-fire environment that has a high light availability, a flush of nutrients, and, and even sometimes a flush of water availability in what can be arid landscapes, which are really prime conditions for establishing seedlings that will grow robustly and replace what was there before the fire. So we see a lot of adaptations across the landscape in terms of the, the forest communities, but they're not the only organisms that are adapted to fire. There's many wildlife species that benefit from fire, just as, as one example. Moose really love to munch on the nutrient-rich um, green herbaceous vegetation that comes back in the first few years after fire. And even people have benefited tremendously from fire. So Phil alluded to this in his answer a little bit, but indigenous communities have burned forests in the West for thousands of years to create open spaces for hunting and to improve the, the conditions for foraging wild foods. And when fire suppression policies were instituted in the, the early 20th century, that led to the extirpation of indigenous burning, which has had tremendously detrimental effects on indigenous community and culture and way of life. So I just wanted to leave with one example of how, um, how species have been adapted to fire. This, this kind of brings home the point. So in 1988, fire started in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. This is an area where Yellowstone National Park sits right at the core. It's one of the largest wildland areas in the United States. And over three months, 1.4 million acres of, of, of land burned, a lot of it forest, but also non-forested areas. These fires were driven by extremely hot wind, uh, conditions, strong winds, and, and it eluded 25,000 firefighters. The only thing that put it out was the snows started to, to come in mid-September. It's been said subsequently that this was the the first time that we had a mega fire that led into the large fire era that we live in today. And, and the dominant media message at the time, immediately after the fires, was that these forests of Yellowstone were destroyed. It was a moonscape, nothing could recover. So you can see a picture in 1989 of, of what some of the area burn looked like. And you can kind of understand just from looking around why you might feel that way. But if we were able to zoom in on this picture, even in 1989, you'd start to see little tiny tree seedlings popping out of the soil all over the place. And within 30 years, in fact, the forest had recovered remarkably well. So you can see a picture here in 2013 of what that same exact spot looks like. And I can tell you from personal experience, because I've sampled off of that boardwalk during my PhD, that the regeneration was remarkably robust. It's not easy to get back in there and take measurements of those trees because it's so dense. So this is just an example of how forests are adapted to a, a remarkable range of, of environmental conditions and have mechanisms to be able to thrive even under pretty severe fire conditions. Yeah, and, and having spent some time in Bozeman, I know that fires in Yellowstone uh, can have uh, indirect impacts on, on people. Uh, and certainly in other parts of the West where the fires are much more uh, interdigitated with human habitation, and probably better to say human habitation has moved into the forest, um, those impacts can be even greater. And Kat, I'm, I'm sort of wondering, you know, we understand that fires have ecological, you know, create ecological opportunities and ecological challenges. Uh, and Winslow mentioned some of the uh, potential benefits for uh, humans, but there are also costs. And I was wondering whether you might talk about, as it were, the social ecological side of fires. Absolutely. And thanks so much for having me this evening. Really great to see such a diverse audience. Uh, to begin with, I want to respond to that question by expanding a little bit on the first two um, questions. Talk about other human conditions that are co uh, contributing to the situation we have right now. So Bill mentioned we've got a lot of development into what we call wildland urban interface areas, places where houses and vegetation intermingle. Um, we're seeing lots of development there, increased population, so more people living in these areas than before. There's a lot of different factors driving that. A couple of them are increasing cost of living in cities. It's cheaper to live in rural areas. 
a lot more people buying second homes in these areas. It's desirable to live in forested areas a lot of the time. Uh, and especially recently, we can work from home a lot easier. So the rise of Zoom towns in wildland urban interface areas has really contributed to us having a lot of the population out in vegetation that was built to burn intentionally. Um, it's also important to mention not everyone chooses to live in these places. Um, for some people, it's a luxury. For others, maybe you grew up there, your livelihood is tied to that area, uh, or that's the home you've had in your family and it's outside a fire district, so you can't get insurance for it. There are a lot of different reasons why people are living in these areas that then leads to them being at risk um, down the road. From a health standpoint, um, smoke really is the most widespread impact we see to communities and residents living in the well and urban interface. Um, this summer is a really good example. We know smoke traveled as far as New York and in previous years, it's also crossed into Europe, um, down to Australia. It's really widespread. Um, and a big driver of that is us having multiple large fires at the same time now that really build up their contribution uh, to low air quality. We definitely know that breathing in smoke is not ideal. We want to minimize it as much as possible. Uh, and we see a lot of consequences on the health side associated with that. There's studies out of Australia that show emergency room um, admissions related to respiratory health spike up about 400% during uh, fire events, and it's pretty similar on the US side as well. Uh, and the impact of smoke uh, on health is still unknown in a lot of ways. Uh, we're still learning about how it affects skin, uh, how it interacts with COVID is another big one. Uh, so there's a lot of room to grow scientifically in this uh, kind of topic. The other piece of health is mental health and well-being. We're seeing uh, an uptick in research around this topic. We're learning more, unfortunately, as more fires impact communities. Uh, obvious one is the more structure loss we see and the more community damage, the higher the rates of PTSD, anxiety, depression, um, there's a lot of me mental health challenges associated with this. Really easy to think, I'm prepared for fire, I've got insurance, but there's not really a way to prepare yourself for all the other consequences that come with it. It's not just about losing a house. Tied to that vegetation loss and place attachment, you probably have a really close attachment to the place you live and you like it. Uh, so if you imagine where you live right now and what it would look like if a fire passed through, um, you probably have an idea in your head, but what if that fire passed through and it was significantly worse than you'd expect? It's a lot harder to recover emotionally, and that's what we see in the science. It's not about the fire itself. It's about an individual's expectations of what was going to happen there. And um, the emotional and mental health um, kind of component of fire really goes underfunded. It's a lot harder to get resources for that after fire, and we like to measure recovery in terms of quantitative things, like how many houses were rebuilt, not many people have fully recovered from um, some kind of health consequence. Cross-cutting theme across all of this is environmental justice. We're seeing really unequal impacts from fire across the US. Folks who benefit from forest management, so maybe a prescribed fire near your community, the community gets all the benefits but smoke is traveling maybe miles down the road. Um, and they're not receiving any of the benefits. So we're really trying to rectify that uh, dichotomy of cost versus benefit um, on the social side right now. That's an area where we're trying to figure out at the moment. Thanks. So uh, in, in, in essence, it's complicated, right? And I think what's really interesting to me is the press doesn't come back a month later, three months later, six months later, six years later, and look at the social mental and physical impacts, we tend to hear, as you said, about rebuilding or places that people haven't rebuilt in. Uh, you know, you see the same thing. There was a thing on Marketplace tonight where they were talking about forest fires and floods and the fact that there's been the success of lack of insurance. And this is obviously going to be both an economic and a social uh, factor. So uh, clearly um, you have a, a nice long runway ahead of you in your career to, to study a lot of these very interesting topics. Um, you know, and I think one of the questions for, for all of you, but I'm gonna throw this one to Phil is, you know, uh, how is this changing with 21st century climate change impacts, increasing human impacts in terms of alterations of landscapes, 
And you know, if you're trying to project into the future, Phil, what are the, the key variables that make it really hard to do that? Yeah, that's, that is, that is the question. Um, and this is, this is, it, this is interesting, both looking retrospectively over the past several decades and looking forward to the upcoming decades. Uh, I've said before, you know, if, if this was a lab experiment, you know, our results would be really clean. And, and what I mean specifically is this relationship between climate and here, so on the y-axis on this graph, this is vapor pressure deficit. So that's again how thirsty the atmosphere is. The the relationship between vapor pressure deficit or fuel aridity can use those interchangeably, and area burned over the last several decades is so tight that you know when we have a year like 2020 and 2021, I bet is going to fit in there too. You know, once we look back, we can say, oh, that's kind of exactly where we expected it to be in terms of area burned. Um, so in essence, what I'm saying is this strong relationship between climate and fire that we see in recent decades, and that we also see from fire history studies spanning the past several centuries to millennia, it gives us very strong confidence that looking forward, um, climate projections are generally indicating that fuel aridity is going to continue to increase. As temperatures increase, this vapor pressure deficit is going to continue to increase, and our vegetation will become, continue to become more uh, fire conducive, so more flammable. So the simple answer is we expect more fire in our future, and there's generally large agreement on that. Uh, it is important to note that we're, you know, we are not at a new normal right now. Um, we are still along this trajectory towards uh, what will be a new normal. One of the key uncertainties in, in how fire is gonna unfold over the rest of the 21st century is which one of these lines we choose here on this, on this figure, right? So what the figure is showing, the, the black is, is observed, so that's happened. And the red and blue are two different potential climate futures. And largely they depend on how humans respond to climate change um, and the degree to which we reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So there's that worst case scenario where we don't do anything. And then there's the optimistic scenario where we work really hard to get off fossil fuels and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And you'll notice that even in the more optimistic scenario, right, VPD is still goes up. And that's in part why we expect to have more fire in our future, regardless of these two scenarios. Um, we're already in some areas exceeding the range of variability that these ecosystems have experienced for thousands of years. And um, either one of these scenarios that we that we go down, we expect that to become more and more common. So we are increasingly entering uncharted territory, not only from the perspective of climate, but now from the perspective of fire. So fire is responding. Um, the, the, so the first key uncertainty there is which path are we gonna choose there? Um, another key uncertainty is at some point, if fire increases enough, at some point, we're gonna run out of, of vegetation to burn. And our ecosystems are gonna undergo pretty major transitions. So we might get a forest transitioning to non-forest. And the way that those two systems burn is quite different in part because of the abundance of vegetation. So we don't know when that will happen, um, but what we can anticipate is that it's gonna kind of be, it, uh, <laughs> an exciting or bumpy ride getting from here to there. Um, so two key uncertainties, which climate future are we gonna go down? And then a more ecological uncertainty is when are these feedbacks between fire, vegetation, and then fuel becoming limiting, when are those gonna kick in in different systems? I'll leave it at that. Great, thanks, Bill. And, and again, I think that you know, increasingly we are understanding the urgency of, of action. 
right? That I think 30 years ago, 40 years ago, scientists were pretty aware of climate change and the vast majority of scientists uh, not only were aware of it, but felt it was a serious problem. But now society, I think, with increasing flooding, increasing severity of storms, and of course, tonight we're talking about increasing both frequency uh, and, and intensity and uh, geographic extent of fires really does, does change that. I want to sort of pick up on that last bit you were talking about and, and so ask Winslow, you know, given all these things, how and why, you know, might forest fires change uh, as, a, in, as part of that feedback loop of increased fire? What does increased fire mean for the change of fire? And how does that affect uh, forests in the West into the future? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in my first answer, I, I spent a long time talking about how forests are adapted to their historical fire regimes. But every time I look at that figure that, that Phil just put up of our future in terms of vapor pressure deficit, I, I never can quite get over how extraordinary it is and, and what it means for how fire is going to change relative to anything we've seen in the last several thousand years. And, and there's growing concern that there's growing concern whether forests are going to be able to be adapted to that and whether they're going to survive in a, in a way that, that we recognize them. So it seems likely that we have a large risk of losing a lot of forest, as Phil mentioned, over the next few decades. And, and even places that remain forest might change fundamentally. So they could become far less dense. And they could also change in tree species composition towards much more um, drought tolerant species. Now, of course, we don't have a time machine to go to the future and actually see what forests are gonna look like in, in several decades. And so one of the ways that we're trying to really figure out that uncertainty about forests in the future is by developing and then using these really complex computer-based simulation models where we're actually representing individual trees and then subjecting them to climate and fire conditions in the future in silica. We do this often at landscape scale. So one set of studies that my collaborator, Monica Turner has led using these models, looked at five different landscapes across greater Yellowstone ecosystem, which I talked about earlier. And they project by the end of this century, we could lose up to 50% of the forest extent. This map here that you're seeing is an animation of a, a simulation that I ran for Grand Teton National Park, which sits just south of Yellowstone. And the green is forested area. So you can see as it changes through the 21st century as a result of climate and fire. And, and in this particular landscape, we lost about 35%. Now there's tremendous amount of uncertainty in these simulations. And one of the ways we try to in, internalize that uncertainty is by running many different scenarios of plausible futures. And so in the very least, we can create an envelope around what are potential outcomes to give us a sense of the range of futures given a set of conditions. So why are forests under threat? Well, the, the underlying cause is climate change. Conditions are getting much drier. They're already drier today and they're likely to get drier in the future. I know Phil mentioned this a little bit, but I just wanted to reiterate this point because it's really important. So recent work by our colleague, uh, Park Williams, has shown that in Western United States and in Northern Mexico, the current dry period that we're in that started in 2000 and continues to this day is the second driest period in 1200 years. That's already today. And looking to the future, the International Panel on Climate Change creates projections of how climate is likely to change. And Western North America is one of the places they've identified as likely to dry more than, some, some, than most places on earth. It's expected based on the, the projections that we could see soil moisture drought, extreme soil moisture drought probability increase 200 to 300% in some scenarios by the end of the century as compared to a pre-industrial baseline. So it's going to get a lot drier than it already is today. How do fires play a role? Well, fat, fires can catalyze the change and allow the system to adjust to climate uh, more rapidly. And the reason for this is because mature trees, even though you know, a drought can kill mature trees, they're still able to tolerate a much wider range of environmental conditions than tree seedlings can. 
And when a severe fire happens, it kills the mature trees. And so the persistence of forest in that location over coming decades depends on whether tree regeneration can occur. And myself and colleagues, including folks in Phil's lab, have identified three different pathways through which changes in the fire regime could lead to post-fire tree regeneration failure. So the first one is if we start to get really frequent fires so that a second fire occurs after the first fire and burns trees before they've reached reproductive maturity. So they haven't produced any seeds yet. That can lead to regeneration failure because you don't have seeds. The second pathway is if we start to get really unusually large burned patches that are high severity fire, where the distance to the middle of the patch exceeds the, the dispersal distance of the unburned trees on the edge of that patch. So in the middle of the patch, you're just not getting seed there. And then finally, as I mentioned, drought's getting a lot worse. And even if we have seeds on site, those seedlings are so sensitive to soil moisture that it's quite easy to kill those seedlings with drought conditions, which can also lead to regeneration failure. And it's also important to think a little bit about why this matters. Why, why really does it matter that our forests are, are potentially gonna change? Well, we benefit tremendously from ecosystem services that forests provide. And the West is no different. So things like um, carbon storage and even the aesthetics of our landscapes are closely tied to the forest. Timber, so economic benefits. And I just wanted to provide quickly two kind of complex ecosystem service effects that these could have. So water supply in the Western United States is obviously critical for, for maintaining healthy human communities. And this drying trend that we've been talking about will almost certainly threaten the water supplies of many Western communities. So managers are, are struggling to figure out how to manage water supplies to meet the growing demand as, as Western communities increase in population. But really interestingly, a recent study that, that I helped with showed that actually when a big fire occurs in watersheds, it can lead to increases in runoff because it kills all the trees. And trees are the straws through which VPD acts as the, to suck the water out of the soil moisture. So if you remove that pathway of moving moisture from the soil through the trees to the atmosphere, you maintain more soil moisture on the landscape and that influences runoff. But it can be quite flashy and the timing can be really difficult. So what this means is that managers are gonna face both managing for extraordinary increases in drought while at the same time potentially trying to manage for these flashy events of increased runoff due to wildfires increasing across our landscape. The final ecosystem service that, that I think is really important to, to consider in the climate change context is the amount of carbon that forests store. So there's a huge push to use forests as natural climate solutions, maintaining our current forests and even replanting places that, at, that were once for us. And, and that's a great idea to help us get to a, a period where we can reduce our emissions. The challenge though, is if it starts getting really hot and really dry and fires increase a lot, threatening our forests, then that tool of using forests as natural climate solutions becomes quite tenuous. And, and one of the challenges too, is that the Western United States is where we have a lot of public lands. And so it's one of the key kind of settings where we could do mass plantings and really try to, to, to maintain a large amount of forest on the landscape. Oh, boy. Um, so I'm going to try and change the trajectory a little. Uh, these are uh, both fascinating, a little bit depressing, um, maybe a lot depressing, but very interesting, uh, both ecological and modeling uh, projections, Winslow. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch gears a little bit. Um, you did have some positive things in there about, you know, shifts in, in ecology and, and change in hydrology that, that could actually be beneficial. So it's not all bad news, but Kat, I'd like you to lift us up a little bit and, and talk about, you know, the way, you know, because clearly from everything Phil and Winslow just said, fires are with us for the foreseeable future. Out West, particularly, they're going to get at least in the short term and the medium term, more severe, more widespread. Things are gonna get uh, worse before they get better in many ways. So how do we 
manage this from a social ecological perspective? How do we help adapt and help humans become more adaptive to the reality of these fire land, fire prone landscapes? Yeah, that is the million dollar question, I think. Um, so obviously it needs to be a pairing of ecological resistance with uh, resilience with social resilience. We're trying to pair it together, we coexist. Uh, but this concept of fire adapted communities has come up a lot recently in policy and in practice. How do we build or um, advance communities that can live with fire if it is to be reestablished as a, a regular process on our landscapes like this? So I'll tackle that from kind of a scalar approach, smallest being at the household level, your property, wherever you're tuning in from tonight, probably a good chunk of you live in the Wadland Urban Interface. And we do have a lot of information about techniques, uh, management of your property that uh, you can do to, to reduce that risk. Things like the Firewise USA program has a lot of great resources. Um, one of the big things we talk about is removing vegetation kind of up against your house, creating buffers, uh, building with fire resistant materials. Uh, some recent studies have shown about 90% of homes that burn in fires uh, are not from the fire coming right up to them. It's from embers, uh, a good way away dropping down. Maybe there's pine uh, needles in the gutter or something like that. Uh, so it's very rarely the fire coming up to your property. Uh, that means even if you're not in a forest, if you're within maybe a mile of it, you could expect some embers to come your way, which is how we saw some of the destruction in Santa Rosa a couple of years ago, some of these more urban fires we're starting to see. So there's that work you can do on your property, but if your neighbor's not doing the same thing, you still have a certain level of risk. So then it comes up a uh, kind of step higher to, what are the people next to you doing? What is your neighborhood doing? Whoever's the weakest link puts everyone else at risk, essentially. So we like to talk about collective action. How can everyone work together to elevate, even if it's just one little step up, um, the risk there? Is it about creating a community evacuation plan? Is it about getting a grant to get a fuel break for your community? Uh, what is there that you can do together? And it's always really hard to get everyone on the same page. Every community has someone who's not interested in being, well, you're lucky if it's just one person. Um, but you're looking for the value that everyone in your community shares. Is there something that's really important to everyone, like wildlife? And how can you frame this as benefiting that? Um, so it's about figuring out the hook in your community. Uh, and essentially, no two communities are the same as well, which complicates this even further. Uh, so we like to talk about while an urban interface communities across a continuum uh, from kind of formal subdivision kind of stuff um, on the left hand side there to working landscape, which is more like ranching communities. If you propose to a very formal subdivision community, um, some change to your homeowners association bylaws to be about vegetation management with fire in mind, that would go down probably pretty well. Uh, on the right hand side, if you ask a bunch of uh, ranches to uh, do specific landscaping around their property, it's probably not going to be well received. So we know for different communities, we need to take different pathways to helping them adapt, different series or sequences of actions. So now we're trying to hone in and define those a little bit better so that we can visit with communities and say, have you tried ABC? Because you don't really like this other community over here. Uh, a lot of the conversation in the front part of this um, webinar today has really been about how do we get up to like these broader scales, landscape level, restoration of fire and um, landscape management. The challenge comes within any landscape. We've got a lot of different communities and they're probably kind of different and no one strategy will help them all. So we've got to figure out adaptive policy that can support these different kinds of communities or different programs. One thing that's been increasingly discussed is kind of what are some straightforward, quick fix solutions maybe for these kinds of things? And people turn to regulation really quickly in these conversations. What if we just find everyone or if we create a planning and zoning regulations across the US, this would solve the problem. But in reality, that's really not feasible. Again, it might go well in California, Colorado, 
I've done research in Wyoming and Utah in rural communities where there is zero interest in that. You won't get support for it, even if maybe it would work. But that regulation also doesn't have people questioning, well, why is that regulation needed? And it's the education or the understanding of why that's needed that we really need to focus on here. Uh, so at the core, we really do kind of need behavioral change. It's not just policy quick fixes. It's not uh, throwing money at problems. It's about having these conversations where we talk about what we can do to adapt to fire, uh, working on that framing. So I'll wrap up by saying we've got to be really nimble with our approach. It's not one size fits all. Um, and it's certainly not one community is the same as every single other one. So be thinking about what it is in your community that is the hook to get people talking. And I imagine, Kat, that it's also harder to do it before you've had a fire. And that once you've had a fire, maybe it's too late, but if, if local communities nearby have suffered, that, that maybe seeing the danger will help people translate into action. So, all right, so we have got a raft of great questions. Uh, we're up to 25 unanswered uh, open questions. So I'm just gonna do a couple, what we call lightning rounds. So um, here's the first one. If you could dispel one myth that you'd like to uh, regarding forest fires, what would that myth be? And we're gonna go Winslow, Phil, and Kat. Go, Winslow. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna build off Kat's answer to the previous question and say the myth I'd like to dispel is that there's a silver bullet solution to the large fire crisis. If there's one takeaway that you bring away from this talk, it's that the fire regimes, the forest ecosystems, and the human communities of the West are incredibly diverse. And if we're going to develop solutions to address the large fire crisis, those solutions need to be nuanced and reflect and be based in that diversity. It needs to embrace that diversity. Anybody that comes to you and says they can fix it with one solution is crazy. Great, Phil. All right, the, the myth I wanna bust is one that you'll hear when you see coverage of any wildfire. You will hear about the number of acres that have been consumed or lost or destroyed. You know, Winslow hit upon this with the 1988 Yellowstone fires, but even in this context, a lot of the area that's burning this year, a lot of that fire is doing good work in terms of performing many similar functions that it's performed for thousands of years and helping land managers achieve the goals that, that they want to achieve. Um, one of the key reasons why, why we need to dispel this myth is because we can't look forward. If we think of every fire as a disaster, then our tendency is to try to eliminate it. And, and that's not a feasible path forward. We spent a hundred years trying to do that, not successfully. Exactly. Uh, Kat, uh, your turn. Yeah, so mine is probably pretty predictable. This is a, an, a lot of, or the myth I want to bust is this is an ecological issue predominantly or solely. We're really seeing that it's much more complicated that if you think about where we are today, there are a series of uh, social decisions that led us to this place, specifically uh, suppression policy in the early 1900s, um, the removal of indigenous fire on the land through um, a sequence of decisions we've got to where we are today. And we're not going to shift away from it overnight. So this is a long-term social problem um, or socially caused problem that requires us all to think about this together to move forward. Great, thanks. Uh, we're going to do one more lightning round. And this is an easy one. What can people do to make a difference? Um, Phil, Winslow, mm -hmm. and then Kat, you get to take it home. Okay, this is my personal experience uh, suggestion. If you live in the West and you've experienced a couple of smoky summers already, hopefully you already have an air filter. Um, if you haven't experienced smoky summers yet and you live in the West, do yourself a favor and get an air filter that you can put into your airspace to, to create clean air, which your lungs will thank you for. Do it now before there's a run on them uh, when the next fire occurs nearby. Great, thank you. Winslow. So for me, uh, I'd like people to contact their elected officials to do two things. First, to advocate for climate mitigation and adaptation policy. That figure that Phil showed that showed our divergent climate futures, the red line versus the blue line, depends completely on decisions that we make about our emissions. So 
we're in the driver's seat at the largest scale of, of what fire future we're gonna live through. And the window for reducing our emissions is narrow. We have to act now. The other thing that I'd like you to advocate for is funding for fire science research. You've seen through this talk that, that science is a critical component for understanding a really complex and wicked social and ecological challenge. And one of the few agencies that funds fire science research is called the Joint Fire Science Program. It's uh, a joint venture by the USDA and the Department of Interior. And despite the fact that fire is increasing, homes are increasingly threatened, this agency's budget is constantly under threat, particularly in the last several years of being cut. We face immensely complex challenges and we're gonna to have to make hard decisions about how people and communities can coexist with wildfire. And we need the best available science to underpin those decisions. Okay, Kat, your, your turn. Uh, my advice is just start a conversation. Uh, talk with your neighbor. What are they planning to do if there's a fire in the area? Do they have an evacuation plan? Have they signed up for your county emergency alert system to get a text on your phone if something threatens your home? There are really easy, small steps to get the ball rolling to have those conversations. So being proactive about knowing what's going on and having your plan in place is going to help you immensely if a fire does come to your door. Okay, so first, thank you for the formal part of this. Um, those of you who uh, have been looking carefully at the slides and the questions understand that we've actually talked about this a little bit before we did this. So uh, it, we never can the answers, but we like these visuals to support our answers. So I hope that worked well. Uh, I'm gonna start with a question that's actually been phrased in several different ways, but it really gets around the question of prescribed burning, um, you know, whether you know, we can use it more often, and then the social ecological side of, you know, it being used in other parts of the world by indigenous communities much more, uh, it was less suppressed and therefore has been a much more common part of it. And how do we use the models that Winslow and Phil talked about to help us show the value of prescribed burning so that we can reestablish re or, or enable indigenous communities uh, to use that tool again and maybe teach us how to use it better? So uh, it's a, a broad question, quick answers. Um, who'd like to jump in first? But I, I'd like to jump in there. Um, I mean, yeah, we we fire is one of the best tools we can use to be able to more safely coexist with fire. So that's just a that's a key uh, that's a key take home. We've known that for for a long time, both Western cultures and uh, non Western cultures, and. Um, not only do we need to enable indigenous communities to to be able to continue to in many cases and 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 re up on their the the land management practices that they've done for thousands of years in the US we have a great example in the southeast of a uh, a culture a community that has prescribed fire tightly interwoven into their way of life so sometimes in the west it's easy to forget you know and search for all these exotic um exotic examples but in the southeastern u.s prescribed fire is integral to land management down there and it is you know it, it's not in fully socially acceptable but the relationship between prescribed fire and communities there is quite different than in the west so that's a great place to look for an example great and and when i'm going to ask the question very pointedly can you adapt your model to answer the question of how, how would prescribed burning change the trajectory of other fires? Yeah, absolutely. So, so we already try to do that. One of the benefits of the model is that you can explore what we call bold management strategies, things that might be risky to actually implement on the landscape. Because let's be clear, prescribed fires have risk attached and often the managers who set them uh, have to deal with that risk. And so we can use these models to run experiments of how much prescribed fire would it take to have an impact and to also understand how prescribed fire as a tool can be more or less effective across the diversity of landscapes in the Western United States, because it may be really effective in some places like 
you know, the Southwest or low elevation forests where a century of fire suppression has led to a big buildup of fuels, but maybe it won't be so effective in places like the Northern Rockies that have had big stand replacing fires um, for, you know, for centuries. All right, and Kat, if Winslow is able to do that modeling and come up with a set of strategies, can we use those to socially integrate uh, prescribed burns back in? Is, do you think that's something that, that we have a hope for doing? I think so. It all comes down to aligning everything to the place, both ecologically and socially in those combinations. It would be great to be able to partner some of these uh, models of ecological things with um, like groups of the public to see how they respond to them so that we can develop some nice kind of scenarios to then implement. Great. All right, um, I'm gonna run a little over and I apologize to people who want to drop off, but I wanna ask a couple more questions. One of them, you know, we talk about forest fires and their sort of self reinforcing and or uh, not reinforcing cycles, but there are a couple of questions on, on agricultural impacts and the way in which agriculture has led to desertification or, or, or use of water, drawing water off the landscape. And to what extent is agriculture involved with or, uh, or, or contributory to the increase in fires, or is it more indirect through climate change and, and other factors? That could be a yes. Yeah, that's a, well, um, I mean, change, agriculture is a major land use change. And when you go back over the last several centuries, that type of land use change, taking something from forest uh, and transitioning it to agriculture, that is actually, you know, over over those century timescales, has led to less fire happening on on landscapes. Um, thinking about the increase of fire over the last several decades, those types of changes are not; they don't come through as the major driver, um, and so they they pale relative to the kind of the overarching driver of this increasing fuel aridity that is on top of everything um, across so the it, ampli it, it amplifies the climate change change it, and maybe drives through uh, aridity and then the, the agricultural landscapes perhaps drawing more water out of the environment. So it would amplify the system or is that pushing too hard? I think there's a little scale mismatch there in terms of the scale of agriculture and the scale of global climate change. Right, so. okay. Um, so Winslow, I'm gonna throw one at you from our next speaker, Dr. Charlie Canham, uh, who points out that, you know, much of the Rocky West has been a net contributor of carbon dioxide over the last few decades. Um, and he's wondering, any chance that that might change? You mentioned planting a lot of trees. Is that your strategy or do you have something else up your sleeve? I saw that question from Charlie. Thanks for that, Charlie. Uh, let me be clear, I'm, I'm not advocating for that policy in any way, shape, or form, merely that it's a, a topic that is on the top of many people's minds. Um, and I think in short, the answer is no. I don't think there's any way over the next two decades you could shift it from a, a source to a sink given the projections of drought and given the projections of fire that we're pretty committed to. Okay. Um, we're already a minute over, but I'm going to give Kat the last word. Um, Kat, if you could talk about a wildfire story to a journalist and the journalist would publish a story that hasn't been told before that you really think should be told, what, what, what theme, what story do you think is not covered well enough in the press about the social side of fires? Gosh, that is a great question. Uh, the thing that comes immediately to mind is how long-term these impacts can be for communities. You see an article every now and then, but it's not at the forefront. We recently did a study here in Flagstaff. There was a fire here in 2010 uh, that caused a lot of post-fire flooding. We restudied them 10 years later last fall, and a huge number of households are still experiencing um, mental health issues, the average household had spent at least $12,000 on expenses out of pocket. Wow. It adds up and then it changes the way they interact with future fires. So look into those histories to see what does it mean for people as they look forward to fires. Uh, definitely needs to be more a part of the conversation. Great, well, thank you. Um, I would like to 
uh, remember to thank our sponsors. Uh, now that I've got the slide up there, I can remember to do that. Uh, the Harney family and Harney Tees, uh, Harney and Sons uh, have been a great sponsor, both of our in-person formerly and now our virtual seminar series and this carries science conversation. So thank you to the Harneys for their great support. And even more, I'd like to remember to thank uh, our staff at Cary Institute who do such a remarkable job of making this look easy. Uh, and let me tell you, it's not as easy as it looks. And particularly when we have three distinguished scientists, all of whom have really so much to say, I am grateful to our staff for helping getting the slides together, for organizing this, but, but in the end, uh, Kat, Phil, and Winslow, you guys were amazing. Um, I am going to be sending this link to family and friends out west, uh, who uh, and friends in Oregon particularly, um, who I think really should hear it and see it. We will be sending out a link to everyone who attended and everyone who signed up. So that's another few hundred people. Uh, to the attendees, thank you for coming. Tell your friends about us. Forward the link that we're going to send you. And have a wonderful weekend when you get to it. Uh, and may the fires quell soon and the rain and snow come early. Uh, I remember, I guess, Winslow, you talked about the snow coming in September in Montana. Uh, it is one of those things about living in the Rockies that is always both a joy and a, and a bit of a downer is how you move from summer to winter with very little fall in between. So may that happen soon and may the rains come soon. But in the meantime, thank you everybody for attending and thanks to our panelists for a really uh, inspiring and scintillating conversation about a real social and ecological challenge that will be with us for decades, if not centuries to come. Have a good night and thanks for coming. <laughs>